Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We have a very special guest today, drummer Pete Parada. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Is that uh, is that your your kit in the background, or is that am I is that an illusion? Is that like a fake background on Zoom or some shit? No, I'm actually sitting in my drum studio here <laughs> at my house. So that's that's the the best background I've got. Sure, it's that, real. That's probably um, become the standard, right? If you're a musician, you got to have a studio at your house just in case these days. Yeah, I mean, it's everything is done so remotely. Um, you know, I get hired to play for people all around the world. They're like, hey, can you put drums on this or creating loops or or stuff like that? So you really kind of have to have your own space. I think it's probably harder for drummers because of the noise factor. Mm. Like this is three walls thick in here. It's It's really soundproof. So I don't not just piss off the neighbors but i don't drive my wife and kids nuts either you know so but yeah it's it's great it's been a godsend to have this the last few years of transitioning into a different kind of line of work to be able to to work from home and to you know keep moving forward yeah 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 um so i think people probably know you best from your work with the offspring but give me give me some of your uh, background tell me your history how'd you get into music and then you know give me some of the highlights Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in upstate New York. My dad was a like a middle and high school band instructor. So it was always very musical in my household. He was very into Frank Sinatra and 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 big band stuff. And my mom liked Neil Sedaka and, you know, pop artists and things like that. And my brothers and I gravitated towards Kiss. And so it was an interesting musical household for sure. But um, when I got out of high school, I moved to LA and went to a performing arts school there for drumming. And when I got out of that, I just started kind of working all over LA, working different jobs, playing in bands, trying to get something started. Ended up in a band called Face to Face, which is a seminal Southern California punk rock band. And that was my first real big, uh, you know, heading out, making records, going on tour, traveling the world type of thing. And from there, I played with a group called Saves the Day and um, some other groups, Alkaline Trio. Um, and then I've filled in on tours with lots of different people, My Chemical Romance, uh, mm -hmm. Devo, and um, you know, eventually ended up in The Offspring for 14 years and um, you know, traveled the world, made some records, had, had generally a, a good time until you know, up to the very end when it just came to a really abrupt screeching <laughs> halt and uh, you know, dis disappointing how it ended but you know had a had a good time while i was there for sure sure yeah uh, before we get into all of that um yeah what what do you so you started kind of in the mid 90s um how have you seen the music industry change over the past 30 years 25 years or so uh, i to me i i think it you know it definitely hit a speed bump in the early 2000s there with napster and and the rise of file sharing and stuff and i i think the record companies you know, we can all look back in hindsight now and, and say they leaned the wrong direction on that by fighting it so hard that, you know, I think it cost artists more than the labels because they've clawed their way back. They're always going to find a way to take advantage of artists. And, you know, they've done that now with streaming. You know, most of the major labels are investors in these streaming services. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're they've found their payout again, but the artists are still struggling. I mean, the, the payouts from streaming are are piddly compared to what anybody used to get from actually selling physical records. And we've all just kind of been, you know, over the last 20 years accepted that music is somehow just free now. And so artists just have to stay on tour. Everything is tickets and t-shirts now because you, you know, the music has become kind of a byproduct or an excuse just to go back on tour, you know, because that's the only way you can make money. So when everything shut down and nobody could go on tour, that's when it, it hit really hard because you're not making those royalties. You're not making those residuals. You know, it's it's very very minuscule compared to what it used to be. Um, yeah, I've, I've had day, friends so. uh, in the industry from a couple of pretty big rock bands um, tell me that they're basically a merch company that plays music. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean that's that's it is what it is, right? I mean, you're always looking to monetize whatever it is you're doing, but um, it, it it's not like the value of the music didn't go down. You know, just yeah, the, it, the avenues of monetization kind of went away, right? Yeah, and everybody still wants to be creative. We still have something to say. You're a musician. You're an artist. You want to put your art out there. You want to put your heart into the world. But 
it's like that side of it almost has to take a back seat to commerce sometimes because you still have to make a living as well. And it used to be you could focus on your music because when you put it out there, you know, even a, a smaller punk rock band touring clubs and stuff, you could make a living from the records and the touring and stuff. And I think that's so much harder now because the music's revenue has been erased mm. and every everything is just you've got to be on the road and you got to be selling merch and now it's like you got to have content on your social media and you got to be interacting and engaging and it it takes time away i think from people's ability to focus on being creative and i think the art ends up suffering because of it sure yeah i mean <clears throat> you know and and i think it's i think there's a parallel to um to the to the film industry as well because you know mm -hmm about 80% of the box office now is international from China and India and things like that. And they only really care that like, they don't like American comedies because yeah. you know, comedy doesn't always translate from one language to another or one culture to another. So it's mostly just superhero movies that do well. Right. Um, yeah. Explosions translate. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Like, so Michael Bay is going to do fine, but uh, people that write comedies, not so much, but it's yeah, it's kind of the same thing. And you're, what what you see now is nobody's making comedies anymore, for the most part. Every now and again, one will pop up. But um, somehow, luckily, a lot of you guys have found ways uh, to continue monetizing. Although I do think it's adding to the stress level a little bit. You know, uh, having to be on the road so much, like you you just don't get paid unless you're touring now, which has not always been the case. It, it didn't used to be like that. No, it didn't. Like I said, you 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 could count on you know every once in a while you get a, a residual check would show up or royalties or something or your album's doing well, you're selling, you're mm -hmm. getting radio play, and it's everything being replaced by streaming has just kind of you know made it so if you're a musician you've gotta you've gotta constantly be hustling, you gotta be on tour, and when you're not on tour you gotta be somewhere like this tracking music for other people or writing or collaborating and. I like what you said about, you know, nobody's making comedies and stuff, but I, I think it's not because people don't want to make them. Nobody's funding comedies. Correct. Yeah, you yeah. Know, they, they, yeah, they look at the market and go, well, that we will give you this much to make your comedy because we can make this much back in the States, but overseas, it doesn't matter if China's your, the biggest market, you know, then you're going to cater to that market. You know, what, what can we make that's going to do well in the States and then over there and everywhere else is kind of minimal you know we're not worried about it but you know and that's not a great place for art to be yeah you know and on top of that you you factor in social media and cancel culture and and everybody's so afraid to speak and say anything anymore that all of a sudden now your movies don't have anything to say or your music doesn't have anything to say because everyone's afraid of you know well i don't want to upset anybody or i don't want the the cancel police to start coming after me and then we end up you know, with very watered down, bland music about nothing. And, you know, and so w at that point, what are you making it for? You know? Yeah, it's curious. Um, you know, the de it's some people call it societal decay or, or cultural decay. But, yeah. um, you know, the the can't the the safety ism that I see in entertainment, particularly in music, uh, which is not, not that it's happening more in music, but it's more surprising to me because Hollywood is, they, they've always been kind of weird about stuff, but the music industry, like within one generation, we went from fuck you, I won't do what you tell me to fuck you, do what they tell you, right? It's like the yeah. uh, people with the entire apparatus, the federal government and all of the institutions and the media behind them still have like hashtag resist and a fist in their Twitter bio. Um, it's mm -hmm. like we, we've reached peak delusion, I guess, because yeah, somehow Everyone's LARPing. Yeah. It, it's like, how the fuck did we go in such a short amount of time from, you know, in my, my opinion, punk and hardcore rock, especially were about, it, they were more closely aligned with American values than almost any other type of music because it was mm -hmm. rooted in questioning authority, right? I mean, that's what we do here in the United States. The entire system of government we set up is, is was set up as such to do that specifically. So a lot of people saw like punk rockers, like, oh, they're just shiftless layabouts. They're good for nothing, no goods, whatever the fuck. But really, I've always thought that they, that, that brand of music 
embodied the uh, the American spirit more than even more than what people would traditionally consider patriotic country music. It's just ballads about nonsense mostly, right? Every now and again, yeah. Toby Keith will write a song about how uh, other people went to war and not him or whatever the fuck. Uh, but you know, th- this the sense that we have some responsibility to just be skeptical and be like, nah, I don't think that what you're saying is right, dude. Fuck you. I'm not going to do what you tell me. Like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that has yeah. evaporated now. I, I, well, yeah. I, I know that it is still there. And, and for a lot of people, yourself, obviously. Um, but it like the broader music scene used to be like that. And you would get made fun of for selling out or being, or, or like capitulating to the man or whatever the fuck else. But now it's kind yeah, of now the standard, you're, right? You're, yeah, now you're torched for having questions. Now you're torched for even broaching the subject of, hey, maybe this isn't right. You know, now you're a lunatic, you know. So, yeah, and it makes me wonder. It's like, well, did you guys ever believe anything you were singing about in the first place? Mm-hmm. Or is it just now it's about protecting? You know, it's easy on your way up to take big swings and stuff. You don't have a lot to lose, everything to gain. I think people, once they get to a certain level of comfort, now it's like, well, how do I maintain this? How do I stay here? And, you know... The art gets watered down. The message gets watered down. It's more bland. Like you could be kind of singing about anything, you know, so the average person can go, well, I relate to that because I think it's about this or I think it's about that. And I I don't discount the value in, in music like that, but it's, it, like you said, it's very stark difference to the blunt statements that were coming out 20 years ago, whereas now it's it's kind of safe and it's homogenized and we don't want to upset the apple cart. We just want to kind of sound angsty and say nothing and, you know, take your money and keep going. So and and there's there are still people in the scene. You know, you've got John Joseph from the Cro-Mags really mm. out there he, leading the charge early, much earlier than me. Um, you know, you got Tommy Vexed out there speaking truth to people. You know, it's there are artists standing up, but you know, you face a firing squad when you do, and you, you've got to kind of be able to stand strong through the through the storm. Yeah, I've read some of your statements about, you know, and we can get into all the stuff that went down with you, but I read some of the statements about what it was, what are some of the things that motivated you to not just go along, to get along. And one of them was that what kind of lesson am I teaching my kids by yeah. just to keep my safety, security, and my job, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure... One of our founding fathers said that people that sacrifice um, their liberty for security deserve neither, right? But yes. moving beyond that, uh, yeah, it was like, what lesson am I teaching my kids if I'm too afraid to stand up for what I believe in? I think that's probably, a, I, I think that's something that a lot of people probably struggle with. Yeah, and, I, and that for me, that was the most important piece. Like, you know, I declined um, the shot for my own medical reasons but i spoke out because of my kids like to show them like hey this this isn't right and these are your rights are given to you but if you give them away it's easier to fight to keep them than to fight to get them back and if i don't show them that there's no opportunity or you know monetary reward or anything like that that's worth giving up your bodily sovereignty or your autonomy to what you believe is right then, you know, I'm kind of a shitty parent. Like what, what lesson am I showing them that it's okay? Well, we're going to, we're going to take a fake card and we're going to lie about this, but it's okay. Or we're, you know, to me to take that route to protect my job was to give up my voice and to teach my kids that, you know, you, sometimes it's okay to lose your voice for a little security. And, and I wanted them to understand that fear is not a good motivator and to not get caught up in the wave of it. And I have a lot of sympathy for people who did like that was a a propaganda campaign like we've never seen worldwide Mm. coordinated all at once. I mean, the messaging was lightning fast around the world. You know, I remember the day that the new message was it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated It was from here to New Zealand to England. Bam, bam, bam. Everybody was on it that day. And it's just like, you know, oh, well, do this thing. We'll give you a cheeseburger. We'll give you a donut. We'll get a, get a free lap dance. And it's like, how can this be about your health if you're saying, take this thing for your health and then go do this thing that's shitty for your health for free afterwards? Like, it, it just, none of it made any sense. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it bothers me still. Um, and I think it bothers probably most people that, that follow us. 
that not one of these motherfuckers has admitted they were wrong, right? Or that they lied yeah. about shit or that they just accepted whatever. Um, the, the statement that you hear out of people instead of um, contrition is that, uh, well, we didn't know at the time. It's like, yeah, we did. Like uh, millions of us were saying to you at the time, this is not that serious. It's a fucking respiratory illness. So, yeah, old people are going to be susceptible to it. Uh, uh, and then we knew pretty much immediately that young people weren't, which is which makes it unique. Right. So the um, flu and other respiratory viruses for extremely young kids can be really problematic sometimes because their lungs aren't fully developed and all this stuff with COVID. It just wasn't like that. Right. And I think the yeah. the mortality rate for infants was like three. 10 millionths of a percent or some shit like that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. essentially zero uh, for, yeah. for the sake of argument. It's like, yeah, no, we knew that pretty much immediately. Um, and then, you know, over the last, let's say six to eight months or so, you've seen news agencies trickle out information like, oh, we just found out this. Like, you didn't just find this out. We, people were saying this in March of 2020 when these lockdowns started, that, yeah. mask, that this, this type of mask doesn't really work and for what you're trying to do that uh there's no and then we find out on the back end that pfizer didn't even check to see if it prevented transmission that wasn't even part of their data set to test that was that was very early i mean it, and um if you looked at the data in january of 2021 if you went to the you know cdc website to mm -hmm. see the very little that was out there it's right there that you know did not was not tested for transmission hopeful that blah, blah, blah. You know, I, my wife took a screen grab of it at the time because she's like, wow, they're not going to leave this up. And we reposted that a few months ago um, on Instagram or Twitter or something. And somebody was like, oh, that's a fake screenshot. And I'm like, it's literally off their website. And yeah. while they're saying one thing on the news, because they can say whatever they want, but where they have to legally have it in writing, they admitted we didn't even test for transmission. It's yeah. not, you know, we hope that it'll, you know, do whatever or keep you out of the hospital or, you know, prevent severe outcomes or whatever. But it was all, it was all, we hope, we hope, we hope. And, you know, nobody had a better answer. You know, I sent that to a few really smart people at the time and said, hey, can you explain this to me? And they didn't have a very good answer. It was just, well, you know, I, I, I can't explain that. And I, I don't know why they did well, relative risk reduction instead of absolute risk reduction, which showed almost no risk reduction. Mm. But, you know, they they skewed it to make it look in the best light possible because that's what big pharma does. And but on TV, they'll tell you one thing and then, you know, where they have to, they'll admit it. But nobody goes looking for that. And so the best response I got from the people who were supposed to know better was I still think everyone should get it. You know, I don't I can't explain why they didn't why all this stuff doesn't look right, but. You know that these are the responses you get when you have some questions. Yeah, it's and like that. It's like that scene it, from Billy Madison where he's getting back on the bus and Chris Farley's trying to tell him how he banged Veronica Vaughn. You know what I mean? He's like, well, "No, you didn't." He goes, "Yeah, but you can imagine what it'd be like if I did." He's like, "All right, dude, yeah. cool, I guess." I mean, you're, but that's not reality. You're just you're just saying shit. And I I yeah. I wonder like, um, you know, well, first, no one will fight harder to to preserve a lie than people have wasted their lives believing it. That's a fact. And I don't know mm -hmm. if it's, <clears throat> I mean, it is very plainly obvious what happened here. There was um, the, the, the United States government, a couple of people, not the entire government, but, but Fauci and a couple other people funded very dangerous research in a place in the world where they don't pay a whole lot of attention to safety, apparently. And it got into the wild sometime in November of 2019. And, uh, you know, I don't think it was intentional. I, I, don't, I don't see any evidence for that necessarily, but they certainly took advantage of it and used it to bilk the American people and glo the global community more broadly out of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars. If you if you take into account inflation and all of the the, the seven hundred and fifty to a million, seven hundred fifty thousand to a million privately owned small businesses, family owned businesses in the United States that close their doors forever. They will never Forever. open back up. A million people, a million families in this country lost everything because of this yeah. bullshit. And it's like, it was very clear what, what was happening here, just extracting wealth from the population and, uh, you know, using the opportunity to erode people's civil rights and stuff. 
And yeah, I, absolutely. I, like, but there, there are still people defending all this stuff. Like, oh, it wasn't nobody. Nobody forced you to get vaccinated. Nobody. Like, it's like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? Uh, yeah. We're living on two different planets right now. Yep. And we uh, you always knew the narrative would change. It was like, hey, get this or you're out of your job or get this or you're a terrible person. And then, you know, all of a sudden, well, no one forced you to. Well, no one did this. But to me, like like everything you just said, agree 100 percent. But the hubris of it of, you know, we're funding this research. Oops, it got out. We got to cover it up. But then to go. And on top of that, let's all there's opportunity here. I, you know, yeah, we fucked up, but there's room for profit. Yeah, yeah. let's let's roll this thing out. And it's just like, man, that's bold. It's that's like, like you're that's... it's like you're walking. You get caught in your mom's room. You're like, hey, you're not supposed to be in here. And you look over at it, and then you reach into her purse anyways and pull out a twenty dollar bill. Yeah, you're like, like damn, dude, you were, were in trouble. You were already caught, man. Get the fuck out of here. What are you doing? But you mm-hmm. know, I, I think it's like, uh, what's that quote from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? Uh, he says that we've gone so far now that our only hope is that you know, what we've done is so crazy that nobody in the position to bring the hammer down would possibly believe how crazy it is. And I think there's yeah. some, I think there's something to that. I really do think that this whole thing was so blatant and so fucked up that some people still can't wrap their mind. Like there's no way that our institutions in the West in the United States pulled all this shady bullshit. Right. But it's very mm-hmm. clear what happened. I mean, the, the evidence is all here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to deny now. And I, 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 I'd be hard pressed to to think that anyone who was really gung ho and true believer and and like I said, I got compassion for everybody that was fearful of this because it was amped up. You were bombarded with it all day. Like you know, I understand if you got caught up in that. But if three years later, with everything that we've learned and even the stuff that is that the media is begrudgingly admitting now and acting like, oh yeah, well we we knew this or at least that that was the information we had at the time. But you know, the science evolved. Like if you're still blinders on going now that they did absolutely everything right and we were all right to to give in to the mandates and go along with it and punish people who wouldn't and segregate society. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, if you're that much of a true believer at this point, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, you know, and the, the going from the science is settled, everyone has to get this to, well, the science evolved once the narrative <laughs> wasn't supporting them anymore it's like well which is it is it is it settled or is it evolving and it's you know you're moving the goalposts wherever it's convenient for the narrative and then saying well no one you know you get to the point of well no one forced you to and now we're at the point of well no one could have known we didn't have this information and it's like we did like you said some of us were pointing it out years ago and got you know torched for it yeah um how did that work for you i mean i i don't I've heard from people, and you don't have to comment on this uh, if you don't want to, but I've heard from a lot of people that Live Nation in particular got pretty crazy about some of the rules that were going on, about having like a a medical person assigned to each tour bus. And it it wasn't a a person with any medical experience, just some asshole with a fucking clipboard or something like that. Yeah, just a PA. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? You're sending hall monitors on the road with fucking rock stars now. That's your fucking gig all of a sudden? I mean, that's insane, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, And what was was it like? And how long did it take for all that shit to to get into place? Because we're like... People start talking about this stuff in late January of 2020. By middle March, I think is what, March 15 is when the f- first lockdown bullshit started. Is that right? 15, there, yeah. yeah. So, like, let, let's call it two months, month and a half, two months. How did it change in the music industry? Were you guys on tour at the time? Yeah, we were in South America around the March 15th when everything was really coming to a head. And, you know, even heading down there, my wife was like, you guys really going? Like, there's this thing that spreading around should you be traveling and i'm like you know i don't have a say in it you know i i have to just go where, where mm. we're told and we got down there and the first show got canceled the second show we played and it felt really weird because we're at a big you know it's like five thousand people there sweating all over each other and i was just like this this doesn't feel right like we shouldn't be here but you know you're you're playing chicken with promoters at that point you know um you don't want all the expense of getting the band and the crew and the gear and everything down there to fall on you. You want it to fall on the promoters. You want something to get worked out. And so we were up until 
you know, probably midnight of the show night we played, we were still waiting for a word. Are we going to Brazil tomorrow? We were in Chile. Are mm-hmm. we going to Brazil or are we going home? And finally, at the last second, it was like, all right, they, we canceled everything going home. And at that point, everything shut down. And it was like mid-March, we were supposed to go to Australia the end of April. And, all the, and you think, oh, okay, it's got to be done by then. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that's canceled. And you're supposed to go to Europe for the summer. Oh, that's canceled. So then you're like, all right, this is unprecedented that this is happening. And then around that time, there was a weird memo that, like you say, Live Nation. I believe it was Live Nation that leaked out that was just a theory they were kicking around in the office about how this was an opportunity to now pass expenses that normally fell on them over to the bands. And this was an opportunity to restructure how shows and deals and everything were done because people were going to need to be getting back to work and there might be some leeway here to, you know, to squeeze a little bit more. Um, And, you know, that got leaked out, I remember. And then they very quickly said, oh, that's not real. It was just, you know, maybe an idea or, or whatever. But by when everyone went back on the road, which was probably 2021, like, I mean, right after my situation imploded, um, bands were heading back out. And so every time something like that came up, people are emailing it to me. So I got sent the protocols, the backstage protocols from one of the biggest tours that was heading out that fall. And it was absolute insanity. It was like there was four bands on this tour and it was like each band will be in a band bubble inside the band and no no bands will interact with each other outside their own bubble in your band bubble you'll be broken down into smaller sub bubbles the band will be in this bubble stage right crew will be in this bubble those are the people that you will interact with you will move through the backstage areas together you won't interact with anybody else you, there will be temperature checks at each point backstage through you know the arenas of you know getting from catering to the stage to the dressing rooms and this and that and i'm like you're taking what is already a pretty lonely existence on tour. Like it's hard. You're away from your families. I think people think it's very glamorous and, and, and there are aspects to it that are super mm. fun, but now you're isolating people down to where they can only interact with four other people on this gigantic tour. It just sounded like if everybody is that afraid to be out there, then you're not ready to be back out there. And if those are your protocols, but you're asking tens of thousands of people to show up and clap for you and sweat and scream and mm-hmm. sing all over each other, then who who are we protecting here? So, you know, it was never about protecting people. It was always protecting profits. And, you know, I, I got sent protocols to another tour later that winter where they wanted people, an entire bus to sleep with N95 masks on <laughs> in, in their bunks on the bus, like this is what we need. People are testing positive. We have to keep sending people home. But the the first tour with the bubbles, I found out that when people got sick on that tour, when anyone tested positive, you know, all, all this precautions were so benevolent. We care about the fans, the abundance of caution, blah, blah, blah. When someone in the crew got sick, they didn't get put in a hotel to quarantine for two weeks. They got put right on an airplane and sent home. No, you know, we're not paying for that. It's not going to cost the tour that we'll just quietly send everybody home. So while they're out there careening and preening around that they're protecting the fans and they care, they're putting people they know have tested positive for COVID on airplanes with other people and sending them home. And you know, that's that's what was happening as far as I know industry wide. Like people weren't doing the right thing or worrying about protecting people. It was just how do we maximize making money and get out, you know, intact. That's insane. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. bananas. Uh, to that live leak memo. Here's some of the bullet points from it. One, uh, artist guarantees were reduced twenty percent, right, uh, right <laughs> off the bat. No matter what else happens, we're just, and that's just like, that's just profiteering, right? There's no, yep. there's no reason for that bullshit. Um, then, for the first time ever. Um, the musical acts were required to have their own cancellation insurance. It's never been like that before, right? Um, because right. shows don't get canceled that frequently. I mean, you, when you hear about them, it's a big deal. It's like a plane crash, right? It doesn't happen that much. When you hear about it, it's like, oh, this dude had to cancel a show. It's like, oh, shit, because 15,000, 20,000 people were going to come to the show. You know, it's a big deal. But uh, typically, the venue 
or the promoter handles that. Um, and the pre because the premiums aren't very high because again, it doesn't happen that frequently, but fair enough, yeah. fair enough. I guess maybe split the cost or something because it is, you know, a situation, but, um, <clears throat> live nation wouldn't pay the artists any of its fee if it canceled due to a force majeure event, right? Yep. Which is in every contract that's ever been written. Um, uh, particularly when it comes to COVID. So one of the Live Nation things, or the reason that PA was walking around with a clipboard was if, let's say, a band member got COVID and wasn't it, that, that show had to get canceled, that PA's job was to document what unsafe activity they did so it would get the fucking company, Live Nation, out of having to pay them. Are, right. you, like, are, are you fucking kidding me, dude? It is a goddamn rock band. What, what exactly is your expectation here? Um, and then, you know, the last one, which is uh, – this one, is, this is truly unprecedented. If the artist cancels a show, they now have to pay Live Nation double their fee. So let's say your, uh, your fee for the show, I think uh, for my buddy's band, it's like three hundred grand a show. They would have to, if they had to cancel a show because of that, they would have to pay Live Nation six hundred thousand dollars. Are you fucking serious, dude? I it mean, sounds like the mob. Yeah, it's like a protection racket. I've never. This is the craziest shit I've ever heard of in my life. And like, you know, you mentioned it before. Maybe it was just some asshole executive, like, hey, here's some of the, here's some potential opportunities we could do. And not all of these things eventually made it in, but the cancellation insurance did. The uh, guarantees got adjusted down and there, there was a PA hall monitor hanging out on everybody's tour bus. You know, mm -hmm. all that shit did happen. So it was like, man, it's already a huge financial risk for bands. Like, especially the smaller bands, not so much. Huge bands, not so much, but middle tier bands. Like, you can, yeah. you, one tour can break you. You know what I mean? The it margins, really the margins are so thin. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be so economical. You have to be smart with you know you got to plan out your drives and your mm -hmm. hotels and you know it's so it's like a small business your margins are very thin and a minor catastrophe anywhere tips the scale to where now you're losing money now now the whole tour was costing you and yeah but like you said you know that leaks out and they say, oh, no, that was just, you know, that's not real. Someone floated around. But it's like, well, it was someone's first instinct over there was how can we take advantage of this to squeeze artists even more and and reset negotiations moving forward on on everything. And then now, you know, some of these actually got implemented. So it's it's disheartening that that's that was the industry's first approach. It seems like the same as, you know, the government's approach, which is like, oops, this thing got out. How can we, how can we maximize our opportunity here? And, and the music industry is no different. I'm sure Hollywood was no different. I, I, you know, imagine actors contracts and different things got squeezed and changed and, you know, movies got exponentially more expensive to make because you had to have how many people with clipboards running around taking yeah, no temperatures kidding. and taking notes and, and whatnot. But it's, you know, never, never let a good opportunity or catastrophe go to waste. Right. And it seems like that's what everybody's first instinct was on this. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it just is absolutely bananas. Some of the stuff that went down there and, um, that was just the beginning, right? That was, uh, that this is like mm -hmm. late spring to early fall of 2020. And then yeah. in the fall of 2020 is when these shots start to become available um, and people just lost their fucking minds. I mean, I, people who have been, who, whose entire like political career or people whose uh, social identity or whose charitable identity or whatever it is, whatever, whatever field they're in uh, was wrapped around autonomy, you know, the individual body autonomy, people who have spent years, uh, you know, trying to uh, secure abortion rights and all this other shit, lost their minds. I mean, they lost their fucking mind. It's their brains melted, and they thought that it was oh, not just okay, but morally righteous to try to force other people to inject shit into their body uh, by yeah. any means necessary, right? And it started yeah. out kind of somewhat casual, and then there was some resistance to the whole thing. 
And then it got really bad. It got very authoritarian in, in, uh, in the United States, which I would not have necessarily expected. It got ugly fast. And it reminds me of, you know, I've been rereading 1984 that I hadn't read since high school. And there's a segment in there where the population every day has this thing they call the two minute hate where they mm -hmm. watch wherever they are, they watch a screen and they're just bombarded with all this shit that they're supposed to be angry at. And by the end of the two minutes, people are like screaming and foaming at the mouth. And it just makes me think like that's kind of what we fell into. People got into this cancel mode where you woke up and waited for your two minutes of marching orders of like, who we mad at today? Who we canceling today? And everyone got on their high horse thinking like, well, this is what everyone's talking about. I want to be on the good people train. So now today we're upset about this. And without even thinking, just turning on people. And, you know, for me and my family, it was important for us also when we spoke out because we were seeing people online like yelling, all oh, the unvaccinated are killing us all and they're terrible people and they don't care about humanity and they're selfish and they're assholes. And I'm just like, well, I think like there's no human face on this and you know, nothing really makes a difference until it hits you personally. Right. And so when, when people that you know and you understand and you're like, oh, that's a thoughtful person. Oh, I've known them for years are like, well, I'm that person you're screaming about. Like it tends to give most people at least a little bit of pause and you know, and you hope that from one person speaking up leads another person to speak up to then you can at least start to have a conversation but it was so like the vitriol was so fast mm. and so sweeping and it was so coordinated like like i said worldwide like every day's talking points travel around the world super fast and everyone's screaming about it on social media or changing their profiles or something and you know yelling about all the people that they're angry at and it's like have you given this any thought or are you just on the train and don't want to get off? Yeah. You know, I, it was it was a really wild thing to watch and, and scary that that was setting these precedents that I think we're still kind of stuck in these cycles of who we angry at today. And I want to be on on the good team. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we divide everybody down the middle and say, well, if you're on this team, then you believe all of this and you hate those people. And if you're over here, you believe all this and you hate those people. And there's no overlap and there's no talking and there's no there's no questioning anything. And as soon as you do, then you're booted. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's not a sustainable way to be. And I, I just wonder, like, when did we get away from being people in communities where we could talk and have conversations? Like if you go out in the real world and talk to somebody, you can disagree on things and still have a civil discourse but you know certainly not online it's it's not available and it, it seems like we're so divided since you know the 2016 election even all of that ramped up everybody into a new sense of anger and othering and you know it really hit me in 2020 when people were like if you're voting for trump then unfriend me now or if you're voting for biden like i you know we're not cool anymore. And I'm like, why are you giving up these real people, tangible people in your life that you've known and that care about you and know you for this machine of these demagogues or politicians or people who don't give a shit about mm -hmm. you, but you're, you're so amped up into this system of I'm angry and I'm right. And I'm self-righteous and everyone needs to, to feel the same way that I do that you know, we've just kind of lost our, our touch of being humans and, and being able to communicate with each other. And I think like a civil discourse or debate is like almost a lost art form anymore because it, it feels like it's not allowed. Yeah. And everyone's afraid to even step one toe out of line because you get pounced on so quickly for even just going, well, I don't know. I'd like more time with the data. I'd like to see more more information here. And it's and, you know, you just get screamed at. Well, the science is settled. We've, we've already decided. So now you're just a terrible person. And I'm like, when did, when did we all agree that this was a good way to move forward? Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, so there, we, we've been warned about this sort of thing quite a few times over the years. Um, but I think one of the ones that not a lot of people knew about was uh, Manufacturing Consent, yeah. written by uh, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky back in the 80s. And it's like, the the premise of the work is that uh, Western mass communication is very effective um, and uh, a powerful ideological institution that can carry out uh, 
propaganda on a wide scale that results in uh, it results in things like uh, utilizing market forces to force people to do things. Um, internalized assumptions is the second one, I think, and that's about <clears throat> the science. Trust the science, right? Trust the science. But we said trust the science, and what they mean was trust our scientists, you know. But that's right. uh, beside the point. And then uh, self censorship, but without extroverted uh, coercion or overt coercion, uh, I think it says. So it's like you you create this social dynamic where people where where the where the market will penalize you like and you lose your job you know uh, if you're a canadian trucker your fucking money gets stolen from you by the canadian government all this kind of stuff or um internalized assumptions where people are just hypnotized into believing well these are the experts they must know because i don't i don't know what the fuck's going on so they must know you know what i mean uh yeah. and then it leads ultimately to there's so much pressure that a lot of people do choose to self-censor and that is the fucking real poison that that is that's how you lose a republic right there when people are afraid uh to dissent openly that is how you lose a republic yeah and that that feels like that's where we're at and that's the scary thing you know i look at my kids and i think about their kids and my grandkids i'm like in two generations we could go from having free speech and being able to to speak your mind to that right is gone and you don't even dare speak what you're thinking because you're worried about the social pressures of it. And I, and COVID was a real big example of that. Like so many people I've heard from that are like, well, yeah, I got the shot, but I was just, you know, I got pressured from my family or my friends, or I wanted to, I wanted to be able to go and do this because, you know, the, the, the social pressure was too much. So I just, I just went and got, and I didn't want to, but I, I just, you know, the pressure was too much. Mm. And it's like, you know, the people putting that pressure out there are watching and looking and going, wow, that went really well. Like, you know, probably more of us pushed back than they expected, but still pretty good results for, you know, for someone with an agenda that large. And so next time they're going to be like, all right, well, how do we improve on that? Because the social pressure thing really works. So how do we amp that up to the point where anyone is afraid to speak even a little bit outside the lines of the narrative because there's a loss there mm -hmm. you know there's whether it's just um a social loss of friendship or people are afraid to be associated with you because you know you're you're willing to speak the the unspeakable or even question it that's a scary place to be you know when people are afraid to go well i really believe strongly about this but i'm afraid to say anything because i don't want it to cost me anything or i don't want to be ostracized or i don't want you know, my friends to think I'm weird mm. and not understanding that a lot of people think the same way. But if everybody's afraid to speak, then you're led to believe that you're the only one that feels like that. And that that's how it felt for me. I mean, today is two years to the day that um, I put out my statement of, you know, why I was out of the band and why I'm not getting the shot. And um, the, the reaction I expected was a firing squad, a blowtorch. Mm. And the the response we got was people all around the world going, I thought I was the only one that felt like this. Thanks for saying something. I thought I was alone here. And so many people felt the same way about it. Like, yeah, I don't know. This just doesn't feel right. Like all the enticements to go and get it. Like it feels kind of gross. Um, I don't understand it. I'm going to wait and see. But everybody's afraid to say something because it looks like the whole world is on board mm. with this. I mean, that was... That was a successful propaganda campaign to make you feel like if you are even having questions about this, you're the only one. And you're selfish, and you're, right? It wasn't just you're, like you're not you're you're an other. It's that you're putting other people in danger, which we know now was not true, right? Right. Absolutely. And you know, and the information was already out there. It hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Just that people are are willing to accept it now. And I'm I'm all on board for anybody that shows up to the party now of like, hey, this wasn't right. I I'm, I take some crap for it online because people are like, no, you know, if you didn't speak up, then and I'm like, everybody's welcome, however their route is to get here. But I do, I would like people to have some acknowledgement of any harm that was done. If you were someone that was screaming at everybody that this is the only way to go and you're a terrible person and everyone has to do this, regardless of 
you know, their medical history or whatever, you should have some acknowledgement of like, man, I said some stuff that was fucked up. I, mm. I pushed, I, I was part of the problem. I'd like to be part of the solution. And, you know, my, my point of speaking out also was, you know, I had a, a medical exemption and I needed to show that it didn't matter. You know, people were love to say, well, everyone needs to get this so we can protect the people who can't. And when you're like, oh, I'm one of those people, it's like, no, fuck you. You get it, too. You don't count. Yeah, right, we're, yeah. we're talking about the faceless, nameless people that we're benevolently protecting. But sure, when it came yeah. down to real world people, you know, it it wasn't true. Well, it that's was how, just another that, lie. That's how Marxism works, right? They don't uh, – Marxists don't love the poor. They hate the rich. That's what it really is. That's why they're – they can talk all their shit, but still they'll fucking step over a homeless person in the street. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, um, just keep going. Yep. Yeah. It's 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 like it's kind of like not in my backyard kind of situation, I guess. But um yeah, it's completely ethically and morally bankrupt way to Yeah, to it's virtue think, signaling right? nonsense. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I'm parading around as a good person, but when it comes down to it, I don't really give a shit. I've explained this to people before because I just like it, it makes me so goddamn mad even thinking about it. But this is the way that this is the way that works mentally. Uh, so you you get all the credit. This is from virtue signaling. You get all the credit for what people normally would get credit for if they were doing the right thing, right? Like helping, doing charity, whatever. You get all the credit and all the dopamine hits without actually doing a goddamn thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're only a taker at that point. All you're doing is profiting off the misery of other people. That's what virtue signaling really is. God damn it. How can you live with yourself if you're that kind of person? That drives me fucking crazy. Yeah. Well, but it's it's uh, re it's supported every day. Like it's a it's like an enabling mm -hmm. thing. Like every everybody's on that train. And so as long as we're all lifting each other up that, hey, you know, we all we all think this great thing. It's it's like offering somebody to move and they take you out to dinner and then the day comes to move and you're like, I already got my reward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I'm busy today. I, I, that's a no, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy that you, you've got people that are, are parading around these virtues that don't really mean much of anything. It just looks good on social media or it makes them feel good. You get that dopamine hit, but you didn't really do much. And then you, yeah. you go about your day saying like, well, I helped, I, I did my part. And that, you know, that was another, another nice slogan. Well, everyone's got to do their part. I got to do my part and you got to do your part. And we're all in this together. And, you know, you're only in it together as far as you're willing to go along to get along. Sure. Yeah. You know, everybody loves you when you're doing what they want. As soon as you say no, that you find out where you really stand with people. And, you know, that kind of, um, being deleted from people's lives comes very fast. And and you're like, oh, okay. I, yesterday we were cool and we were family and today we're never going to speak again because I won't do what you want. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's not really how that is supposed to work, is it? No, right? Um, your fam family, you're, you're, you stick together. Yeah, it's weird uh, about the family thing. So this the psychological principle... Uh, is called kin selection, right? So there are the people that are related to you, and then there are the people that you adopt as your family. Not literally, but the people that you adopt or consider your family as you go through life. Friends, you know, the military, it's usually your buddies you were in the military with or whatever. Um, it happens in a lot of ways. You know, neighbors sometimes, although that's probably quite a bit less likely these days than it used to be. But mm -hmm. there is this process of Ken selection. And typically, you know, there is a broad range of thought in a group like that. People, it, it isn't true that people only hang out with people that think like them. I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Um, there, there's, there's quite a, there's disparate opinions, a lot of stuff. But what has happened is, and this has always been the case, there are non-negotiables, right? Like you're not going to make friends with a fucking crackhead murderer or something or a pedophile, right. like that's not gonna be part of your group of friends or the people that you consider to be your family. Uh, but, so so it was a very narrow not list of non-negotiables. Like it provided you're a good person, whatever that means, right? And you don't, you don't do these horrible things, we can probably get along. 
but now our list of non-negotiables has broadened exponentially to include shit that doesn't fucking affect our lives in any way. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I'm on this team. I believe this, so fuck you. But, you know, in the NFL, Cowboys fans and Redskins fans hate each other, but they're still football fans, right? Like, they're still playing generally the same game here. We are in completely (laughs) different realities at this point. Like, you can't even be around people that don't think like you anymore. And that's... Like, there's an inevitable end to that kind of scenario, right? And it is conflict, some kind of violent conflict, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, And nobody wants that, I don't think. Some people talk about it, but I've been, I've I've done real war. You don't want that shit. It's not fun for anybody. All the people that aren't capable of taking care of themselves, they die. You know what I mean? Once all this stuff goes away, they die immediately. All those people, it's like millions of people just die for no fucking reason. Uh, So I don't think anybody should be clamoring for fucking war. Uh, Certainly. Yeah. And is it not a control mechanism that we are that divided? It's like if if we're to the point where we we have, like you said, the the list of non-negotiables is so large now that it's pushed people apart. You know, someone's benefiting from that division. Someone's profiting from that. Someone's, you know, someone's got a way of taking that oppor finding that opportunity and profiting off of mm-hmm. it. And, you know, for me, I've got, we've lost plenty of people from my family and our lives, but, and we've made, you know, new people, found new people along the way, but there's plenty of people in my life, clo- people close to me who don't agree with me on, you know, medical freedom or, or my decisions around this issue or, po- you know, politics or whatever. We talk about other stuff. Like it does, you don't have to erase somebody from your life because they disagree on something. It's like agree to disagree, and and yet you can still be friends. You can still be family. You can still have a relationship. Everything doesn't have to boil down to, well, we don't we don't agree on every topic. So I guess I guess this is where we part ways. Like it, it's crazy to me how many people will end lifelong friendships and relationships now over, you know, someone's politics or someone's. You know, did you do this? Are you getting on? Do you agree with the news? Do you do you follow all these same things? Like we did. I just wish people would realize we don't have to erase someone from our lives just because we don't agree on every issue. And that shouldn't be a controversial thing to say. Yeah, I mean, th- this is pretty ancient wisdom, right? I mean, Sun Tzu mentioned this. The Bible mentions this, that a house divided against itself can't stand. I think uh, yeah. Sun Tzu said something more to the effect of it's a house divided or a kingdom divided is laid to waste or whatever. But the, the premise is the same, right? Like if you <clears throat> survive, survival is about resilience. You know what I mean? It's about, you know, and, and we can unpack that onto every layer of this conversation from just letting your immune system do what the fuck it's supposed to do uh, to us collectively as a society being resilient against not just pathogens but social pathogens as well like nonsense that people are trying to program us into and it does concern me quite a bit that people have been so easily duped i my, i do sometimes feel hopeful that this was so egregious and so obvious that the next time it's tried people are going to be like eh, i don't know and there is some data to reflect that i think only like 18 percent of people who are eligible for this last booster bothered to get it uh, so yeah. people are kind of over that, but we'll see, right? We'll see you on the next one. I mean, it, it is true <clears throat> that we should, uh, we should always be willing to, to welcome people back to the flock, right? Uh, yeah. it, it doesn't, it doesn't benefit you personally. And it certainly doesn't benefit American society. If you, you know, perpetually exclude people who made a mistake at some point provided like you've got to be willing to. Uh, not not prostrate yourself. None of that embarrassing bullshit. That that is unnecessary. That that's that's ego. That's nonsense. But just like, hey, you know what? That was fucked up. I was definitely wrong about mm-hmm. that. And look, we're all wrong about shit all the time. Absolutely, this is the way it is, man. So you know, I, I agree with you. There's no there's no benefit now. Politicians who tried to force people to do shit. Politicians are all cunts in the first place. I don't trust any one of those motherfuckers. <laughs> but you know. The people that were in positions of power who were who were authoritarian, I will never forgive them. And I don't think anybody else should either. But your friends and family, Jesus Christ. If you haven't spoken to your friends or family for the last couple of years, try to fix that because that's fucking dumb. Yeah. 
It's super dumb. And, you know, again, to, to lose people out of your lives over a certain issue or, or this or that because of social pressures or, or anything like that, it's, it's crazy. I mean, if, I, if all I did was talk to people that believed exactly everything the same as me, what am I ever going to learn? I'm, I'm just going to dumb me down, like, because we're just going to confirm each other's biases or, or information that we might have wrong. Like, I'd much rather talk to somebody with vastly different views in a civil manner where we can discuss things. And even if we don't agree, I'm going to learn something. They're going to learn something because you're going to get a different perspective. And so, yeah, to me, anybody that wants to come around and go, yeah, I'm not. I'm not getting any more of these shots. That that was fucked up. That was crazy. I I got swept up in it. I got carried away. Great, you know. But some kind of acknowledgement. But yeah, you know, these politicians that are all of a sudden trying to rewrite history like they were always against this and never supported mandates. And it's just like you know that the internet exists. Everything you said is is still out there. But mm. they're betting. They're betting that you won't look, or they're yep. betting that it won't matter. And, you know, that kind of thing is just gross. But it it is, yeah. That's what we're dealing with. I mean, but it's obvious what's happening too, right? I think I, I, I really do hope that, and if you're out there and you are, you know, trying to reestablish comms with these people, there are some methods, I think, that I found effective, not, not in this particular instance, but uh, similar stuff over the years to reconnect people from... Let, let's I, it's it's reductive to say the right and the left because that's not really what it is but yeah. you know whatever whatever the division is <clears throat> you know these the people who um who need to be brought back into the fold they have agreed with you on this very subject with different circumstances before right like the government mm -hmm. uh colluding with big business to rob americans that's that's something that has been like labor unions have bitched about that for years, right? The left has bitched about that specific thing for years, that the Republicans are just making sure their buddies get paid, the military industrial complex and all this stuff. It's like, yes, you're correct. And over here on the medical side, that is, that's also what's happening, right? You just got to show the parallels between those two things. And I think there are, there are a lot of reasonable people who are holding on to this shit because every time they try to gracefully back out of it, somebody tries to come and dunk on them. Like, yeah, you fucking mm -hmm. idiot. Fuck you. You're stupid. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, cool, man. Who, who are you doing that for? Like, what, what, what do you expect to happen from doing that? I, I just don't understand. Yeah, well, so a lot of people's favorite dunk on me two years ago was, you know, well, look at this stupid ass drummer is in a band with a guy who has a PhD in in uh, microbiology, but he thinks he knows better. Mm. And now my favorite thing is all these comments. I'll still get notifications that someone goes back through there and will comment like, well, this aged poorly <laughs> or, you know, and and the people that were screaming the loudest about that are deadly silent, disappeared, gone, like have nothing to say now. But, you know, when when the wave is cresting that way on top of somebody like me yeah you pile on like it's safe that's the safe place to be is let's go dunk on the dumb drummer but it's like my positions haven't changed but everything that i got called crazy for strangely common knowledge now yeah yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. and but i i would say it's a little worrying like watch out this fall because you know they just said pfizer's profits were down 54 percent the last quarter because no one's taking this booster mm -hmm. so magically they're going to have some new new product this fall that there'll be a, a fear campaign of like oh everyone's got to get this you know monkey pox didn't quite catch fire last year so you know they they need something to prop that back up and yeah they, they do keep trying there was a story uh, about a week ago it's like oh there's a new covid variant in india that's resistant yes. like shut the fuck up dude nobody cares anymore and it got no mm -hmm. traction at, at all so they're going to try something different this time i'm sure um, yeah. They tried monkey pox. That didn't work. Um, yeah. Monkey so pox. That, and that gave me hope. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was a good one. Well, I mean, it kind of disappeared under, um, it kind of disappeared under strange circumstances. So monkey pox came, comes out. Then we discovered that it's only in the gay male community. And then kids and dogs start getting it. And like, all right, cool. That's kind of weird. Um, and then the story just disappeared forever. You know, I haven't heard another mm -hmm. word about it. Um it's just the, you know, I think they're going to continue to try to do this stuff. So it's like yeah. really important that one, we build a resistance to it uh, communally, which is to say, 
you know, don't fucking back your friends and family members who were wrong before into a corner where they have to double down on their wrongness because that's not helping right. anybody. Uh, yeah. And then also, you know, just arm yourself with the information. Know what you're talking about. Don't just fucking randomly share tweet tweets and Facebook posts like, you know, old ladies do, <laughs> and, and, you know, like your, your, like your mom and grandma does without reading what, what's actually going on there. It, yeah. It and make it a it, conversation, not, not a, a, a confrontation, yeah, yeah. you know, make, no, don't go at it like an argument. Cause if all we're doing is shouting at each other, then yeah. there's no point. Yeah. Um, before we get out of here, uh, tell everybody where, what you're up to now and where they can find all your stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can go to my website, just my name, PeteParada.com. Um, I do drum tracking here for my home studio. I have a producer sound pack of loops and other drum related things on splice.com. Um, I have a new band uh, called The Defiant uh, with Dickie Barrett from the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, mm -hmm. Greg Camp from Smash Mouth, uh, Johnny Rio from the Street Dogs and Joey LaRocca from the Briggs. So our first song is dropping August 18th, coming right up. And the whole record will be coming out the end of October. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And um, yeah, and you can find me on Twitter or Instagram just at Pete Parada. I don't have Facebook. Um, so if there's any anything with me on there, that's not me. Cool. Well, look, man, I, uh, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming today. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, anytime. And uh, thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen.